Welcome everyone to this incredibly special and international SWP TV live event. Tonight we're going to be discussing the question, Palestine, a new intifada. We'll of course be focusing on the significance of the Palestinian uprisings that we've seen over the last few weeks and in response to Israeli repression and domination. My name is Sophia Beach, I'm a Jewish anti-Zionist socialist and member of the Socialist Workers' Party here in London, and I'm going to be hosting our discussion tonight. Obviously, our discussion comes at an incredibly important time. We've organized this panel because of what we've seen happening on the ground in Palestine. We've seen some of the most phenomenal resistance, which has been met with brutal Israeli terror, from the forced evictions and violence in Sheikh Jarrah, the storming of the Al-Aqsa Al Al Mosque, and also the continued bombing of Gaza over the last week. But in spite of this, Palestinians have continued to resist. And we've seen Palestinians in Gaza, historic Palestine, but also across the world with people who stand in solidarity with them, protesting against the ethnic cleansing of the Israeli regime. So of course, as always, I'm not joined, I'm not here alone tonight. I'm joined by three absolutely amazing speakers. So first up, I'd like to introduce Rafat Alarir. We are so excited to have Rafat here with us tonight. He's a Palestinian author, editor of Gaza Writes Back, a professor of world literature and creative writing at the Islamic University of Gaza, which is actually where he's live streaming from right now in Gaza City. So welcome so much, Rafat. Thank you for joining us in solidarity to all of you there in Gaza. Thank you for having me. Thank you. We're also here joined by Hossam El Hamalawi, a journalist, revolutionary socialist, who's part of our sister organization in Egypt and has followed the resistance in Palestine and across the Middle East for many years. Hossam is actually tuning in live from Berlin, so a very international panel already. So welcome to you, Hossam, and thank you for joining. Thank and our you, last Sophia. speaker tonight is Ilan Pape. Elan has joined us on a few of our live TV events so far. He's an Israeli academic, historian, author of books such as Ten Myths About Israel and, and the, sorry, A History of Palestine and so on. And Elan is streaming in from Haifa. So welcome to you, Elan, and thank you so much for joining. Thank you. And of course, the last people that I have to welcome tonight are those of you who are watching at home. I'd like to remind you to please click share on the event, comment any sort of questions or comments that you may have for our speakers. I'll try and feed them in and to like the event. We really want to get as many people watching this as possible because it's such an important issue. So I think it's best that we just get underway and start speaking to some of our speakers. So I think, of course, the first thing we have to start with is the situation on the ground in Palestine. So Rafat, I want to come to you first. Of course, we've seen the horrific scene of the Israeli bombardment, but what can you tell us about the situation on the ground in Gaza right now? Uh, the situation is utter and absolute uh, destruction, unprecedented destruction. Uh, Gaza has never seen something uh, like this because Israel has added something new that it didn't do uh, uh, like this before which is the total complete destruction of the infrastructure, complete roads with the access to water, electricity, electricity lines, and even the sewage uh, pipes that almost totally obliterated from so many, uh, so many uh, areas. Israel is intentionally uh, targeting uh, Gaza's economy, Gaza's uh, businesses, and, and Israel did this before but at this time, we see deliberate, like they would be bombing this particular place because there is a particular small business here. This morning, uh, 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 thousands of uh, Palestinians in Gaza uh, woke up to the shocking news that Israel destroyed uh, one of the most famous buildings near the universities that houses uh, uh, many education centers, research centers, one uh, that is unique in terms of uh, the, in the Hebrew, uh, translation and in Israeli studies at uh, Nafha uh, Center it, 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 it provides. And Gaza's biggest bookshop was also obliterated. The only, probably the only bookshop that provides English uh, books uh, to Palestinian readership. It was gone, it, just like that was gone. So there is this deliberate 
uh, 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 Israeli attack on these places. And we talk about uh, the, the official numbers is that there were, uh, there are uh, about a million dollars of direct co uh, costs. But if you think about the building, the media tower that fell, for example, uh, uh, there are so many businesses. It means there are so many uh, people who will be rendered unemployed. It means there will be thousands of families kept without uh, without a breadwinner, without somebody to put food on the bib and on the table. But most importantly, it's the, uh, the the people Israel is killing. People is intentionally and systematically targeting people as they slept in 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 their homes, in the safety, so to speak, of their of their homes. We have whole families obliterated. Over uh, 210 Palestinians were killed in, in eight days. 60 of them, 61 of them are children. 34 of them are women. And four of these women were, were pregnant. They died uh, before giving birth to, uh, uh, to their, to, to their uh, uh, babies. And uh, a final point, probably or two briefly, I, I always love to emphasize because they usually go un, un, underreported, is the first Israeli strikes targeted Palestinian farmers. And many people would wonder why, why, why is this happening? It's because Israel is targeting the poor people, the laborers, the, the workers, the people, the farmers who uh, work, who, who get paid day by day, who, ha who have the bare minimum you know, to, to feed their family members. And if those people are terrorized, they don't go to the fields, to the farms, to pick, to harvest and bring food, vegetables and fruit to the shops and and to the people. And the other thing is Israel's intentional attacks against uh, the health sector in Gaza. So many clinics were, uh, were targeted, uh, 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 in addition, of course, to schools and mosques uh, and Gaza's only uh, COVID-19. Gaza is plagued nowadays by COVID-19, but Israel uh, uh, doesn't care about this. Destroyed, damaged the Gaza's uh, only uh, testing uh, uh, COVID-19 testing uh, center. It's it's total. I, I described this to the BBC as the blitz number two. It's London in 1940, uh, 1941. Thank you for that, Rafa. Of course, I have to say again, solidarity and our hearts go out to you and all those in Gaza. I think you're right to say that these Israeli airstrikes are strategic, bombing media towers, apartment blocks, leaving thousands homeless, thousands injured, and of course, hundreds dead. It's absolutely disgusting and awful to see to see the actions of the Israeli state bombing roads that hospitals go up to. And of course, we can't ignore the effect that the pandemic has in the background of this. And, you know, despite this, we've seen Palestinians bravely resisting over the last few weeks in the face of such a scale of violence from Israel. And today, of course, we've seen mass protests and a general strike. I was wondering if I could ask you what you have to say about this recent wave of resistance in Gaza? Uh, most of us Palestinians want this to end uh, the easy way and end to the aggression, the occupation, the apartheid, the racism, and that's it. We don't want to go uh, to armed resistance. It's not the first option we have, but we are occupied. We are uh, brutalized, besieged, oppressed. Uh, not today, not last week, not 10 years ago, started uh, even in 1948, uh, started uh, with the Balfour de Declaration that uh, rendered uh, Palestinians, Muslims, and Christians, and even the, the Jews living there uh, as people uh, uh, as un uh, unhuman, worthless, in a way that they shouldn't be here, and we should be shipping uh, Europeans from uh, from from uh, uh, Europe. So what the resistance has been doing is is a miracle. Uh, Gaza, Hossam probably knows uh, more. Uh, Gaza is in a way, there is no way out of this. You, it's impossible to bring materials, to import things. Even people who live in Gaza here, even you know people who are part, part, part who are members of these uh, resistance groups are astonished at how sophisticated uh, this insistence on on life because as as Palestinians, we believe that Israel is not, uh, as an apartheid racist regime, is not after, uh, it's not only after armed struggle. Israel is killing Palestinians everywhere in the West Bank, in, 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 in Sheikh Jarrah. Uh, Palestinians 
in Haifa and Akka are being also pogromed and, and brutalized. So uh, Israel is not against the resistance as much as it is against the very existence of, of us. And, and as Palestinians, we have the moral obligation, the right, the legitimate right, but also the moral obligation to defend ourselves, to defend ourselves in a way that uh, gives an example to the people around the world, to the struggles of the people around the world, whether uh, uh, brutalized by uh, systematic uh, structural racism, like in America, uh, or uh, other peoples, indigenous people here and there, because as, as, as Palestinians, we do believe that we are part of this global struggle for, uh, for racism and finally for against racism. And finally, the, 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 the wonderful thing here is that Palestine as a whole came against this for the first time probably in, 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 in 70 years or so. Uh, Haifa, in Akka, in Yafa, in Lid, uh, Jerusalem, the, even the West Bank is, 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 is moving, is, you know, Try, is boiling in a way we haven't seen in like 20 years, like in the in the second uh, uh, intifada. In addition to the amazing global mobilization and solidarity and support, uh, uh, again and movements around the world uh, going out for Palestine, going out for Jerusalem, for Gaza, uh, uh, is is, uh, is wonderful. We need to build on this as Palestinians, and we sub we we love this, we support this, and it means a lot uh, to us. Thank you so much for that, Rufat. I completely I couldn't agree with you more about the scale of the resistance and the national unity actually we've seen amongst Palestinians. We'll return to you a little bit later, but Hossam, if it's okay, I'd like to come to you now. I mean, you're a journalist who has written about and followed the Palestinian struggle for a number of years. I've actually got two questions for you. Um, I mentioned that there was a general strike in uh, Palestine today, and Kim on Facebook has asked the question that she's she's asked. Um, I was I was lifted to see the strike in Palestine today. What kind of economic power does a Palestinian strike have? So there's that question. But I'd also like to ask you a broader one about what you make of recent events and how would you characterize this revolt? Uh, first, I have to uh, thank the comrades in Britain for uh, putting this um, uh, event together. Because as an Arab and as a Palestine solidarity activist uh, and as a newcomer here in Berlin, uh, I've never felt as alienated in my whole life as these days. Uh, not only do I have to put up with the racist uh, discourse of the German state that's pro-Israel, but even the German reformist and the revolutionary left, they both decided to throw the Palestinians under the bus again and again and again and either side clearly with Israel or to put together uh, or to put forward this garbage argument about the two sides that, you know, somehow there are just two crazy, you know, I mean, warring sides and they need to uh, uh, mellow down. Uh, but the comrades in Britain had a very clear pro-Palestinian resistance uh, 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 position. And I felt that I, I really had to express my gratitude because the level of my expectations here in Germany ha has, has really gone down so low. Uh, regarding the question uh, first uh, that was asked from Facebook, because I think that this is uh, really, I mean, the central point here. Um, in the case of South Africa, uh, the it, it was an apartheid regime, but the white ruling class uh, ran the economy and their workers were black. So even when they practiced racism against them, even when they practiced genocide, ethnic cleansing and, and, and apartheid and all sorts of the package uh, of practices that's uh, associated with it, the, the black working class had the power to bring down apartheid by mass strikes. Unfortunately, in the case of Palestine, even when uh, uh, they bravely and heroically managed to pull together the general strike today, and it would definitely inflict some level of pain on the Israeli state, but the Zionist experience in, pa in Palestine, the settler colonization of Palestine, made sure from the start to marginalize the Palestinians and to throw them out of the economy. So even when they go on mass strikes, I mean, you don't really find... Uh, uh, like workplaces where there are like Jewish and Arab workers, you know, I mean, working uh, shoulder to shoulder. And and if that's the case, usually, I mean, the Jewish worker, you know, I mean, is here while, you know, I mean, the Arab worker is just doing the unskilled uh, labor. They are two 
kind of like separate economies. And in the history of the Israeli working class, unfortunately, they haven't taken a single progressive stand towards their brothers and sisters in Palestine because it's a settler colonial project. So although the strikes are important and we should encourage them, unfortunately, they are not enough to bring down the Israeli state like the case of, of South Africa. And the last point that maybe I want to um, um, uh, make now um, uh, before passing, you know, I mean, the mic to Ilan um, is that this, I, I'm almost 44 years old. I got into politics as an Egyptian via the Palestinian cause. I got radicalized via the Palestinian cause. I got politicized by the Palestinians. The Palestinians have always been a huge source of inspiration for me and my generation of activists and the following generations and the preceding generations. I'm almost 44 years old and never in my life did something happen in Palestine that didn't trigger a solidarity protest in Egypt or, or mass even uprising in Egypt, except in the current situation. It's because since 2013, since the military coup that we had and, and the victory of the counter-revolution, the counter-revolution went after every single cause that the Egyptian revolutionaries have adopted and put forward. And the first, of course, among them, or one of the first among them was the Palestinian cause. So after dissent was completely crushed in Egypt, you can't even have a single protest uh, now in Egypt. And only uh, a, a female journalist took a Palestinian flag and went to Tahrir two days ago, and she got detained, but then released right away. And there is another one who tried the same, and he disappeared. We don't know, you know, I mean, where he is uh, at the moment. But it is, it, it also tells you to what extent do the Arab rulers in general fear the Palestinians? Because the Palestinians, when they resist the Israelis, they provide an inspirational role to the Arab masses to follow suit and take up an uprising against their own domestic rulers. Thanks for that, Hossam. Um, and also, you know, solidarity to our comrades in Egypt as well. I actually want to ask you a follow-up question before we pass on to um, Elam, which we, which we definitely will. I mean, you mentioned about how the Palestinian struggle has really inspired people all across the Middle East and has really run like a red thread throughout uprisings within that region. And of course, we spoke about the tactics of strikes used in South Africa and so on. We have to learn from the history of resistance and the lessons of the past. And Rafat mentioned that we hadn't seen any sort of scale of resistance like this really since the Second Intifada in 2000. Even, you know, a lot of people are saying that 2014, the siege of Gaza, that these, these scales of resistance are much bigger. So I'd like to ask you the question, of course, the meeting title today is Palestine, a new intifada. And I was wondering what your take would be about the similarities between the first in 87, the second in 2000, if there are any similarities with that now, but also if there are any differences from previous intifadas with what we're seeing on the ground in Palestine today. Uh, I think it's still a little bit too early to 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 decide uh, where the events are going to uh, develop into which direction. But definitely there is something different this time. There is something different on 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 series of levels or or a number of levels. Uh, number one is that the first intifada in 1987 was largely confined to rock throwing and to civil disobedience and to strikes. There were armed operations, but they didn't play that much of a central role, like the second intifada, which was definitely much more militarized, and the Palestinians took up arms. And I would like to say that it's at their absolute right, like any occupied nation, to carry up arms to, liber to liberate their own lands. And and and, but at the same time, it wasn't a coincidence that it was much more militarized. I mean, it came on the heels of the liberation of southern Lebanon where Hezbollah provided uh, a model for the, uh, uh, the armed uh, uh, resistance uh, in the region against imperialism at the time. So it, it definitely boosted this military side. But also um, the Palestinians have been uh, like building originally an infrastructure by Israel, you know, uh, uh, with the Oslo uh, Accords to establish security services to suppress dissent. So in a way, but these guys were the foot soldiers of the Palestinian revolution previously. So definitely a section of them refused to continue and they carried up arms. 
This time, it's extremely unique for the following reasons. You have like three or four parallel tactics that are developing uh, alongside one another. You have an armed resistance from Gaza, from a liberated besieged uh, uh, territory. You have inside the Green Line or uh, uh, inside historical Palestine, you have the so-called, uh, they used to call them Israeli Arabs, but you know they call themselves Arab 48 or the 1948 Arabs, uh, who are rebelling and demonstrating and, and carrying out civil disobedience and organizing general strikes. And at the same time, in the West Bank, where you have the uh, Palestinian Authority, that's clientelistic. And it, I mean, these guys should not be uh, treated in the West as like, you know, the legitimate representatives of the Palestinian people. The Palestinian people know quite well that they are corrupt and that they are clients uh, of Israel. So in the West Bank, where the Palestinian Authority had crushed previously the armed resistance, there is like individual attacks, spontaneous attacks, coupled with mass protests and demonstrations uh, in front of the roadblocks, uh, demonstrations uh, in front of the settlements. So you have like three growing trends and, and one is like helping the other. I mean, usually when when a national liberation movement carries up arms, you know, it substitutes itself for the masses. But this is one of the very few and unique experiences where armed struggle is happening alongside a popular uprising. Where is this heading? I think we'll have to wait a little bit before uh, uh, judging it. Great. Thanks for that, Hossam. That's incredibly interesting and a really clear layout of the situation that's on the ground right now. Um, we're currently on about 500 people watching, so I'd like to encourage people to continue to share the link so we can get that message out. I'm going to come to you now, Elan. Um, you're an academic and a historian who's written extensively on the Palestinian struggle. And I'd like to ask what you can tell us about the recent protests, both Hossam and Rafat have mentioned that actually what has been quite a unique situation is that we've seen protests in historic Palestine, 48 Palestinians resisting and so on. And I wonder what you think is significant about you know, these Israeli cities that are rising up and what do you think this says about the trajectory of the Palestinian resistance currently? Yes, Sophie, again, uh, thank you for, for having me in this uh, great uh, panel and uh, very honored to be with Rifat and, and Hossam and, and with you uh, in this historical moment. That This is really something we all have to appreciate and, and, and respect. Um, I, I agree with, the, with everything that was said so far. I think there is a unique sense of unity that wasn't there before. I don't think it was there even in the second uh, Intifada. I think it's, it's something very different. Uh, but I would like to, to take a, a wider uh, view on this kind of... Uh, wider context, to provide a wider context for this. I don't think it started in this uh, uprising. I, I think it was there before, and we already noted uh, this when we began to see a generational shift in all the Palestinian communities, wherever they were, whether it was uh, among the 48 Arabs, whether it was uh, in the West Bank, among the refugee communities in the Arab world and the refugee communities that became refugees once more and arrived uh, in Europe and the more veteran exilic uh, communities of Palestinians. Uh, one thing that is very clear that comes out also from the demonstration on the ground is that factionalism, party affiliations, uh, loyalty to kind of political tribalism uh, is not there anymore. Uh, I, I, I'm old enough to remember a lot of demonstrations and protests and marches where each faction made sure that its particular banner and slogans are uh, distinguishing them from other factions. This time it was totally uh, united uh, and you had a sense for the first time in many, many years, and I think uh, Rifat uh, mentioned that, for many, many years uh, you didn't have that sense of consensus, of unity, of purpose, of uh, willingness to commit to sacrifice in order to change uh, the reality. And it did not begin this, uh, as I say, uh, today. Uh, you could already see it in the last two or three years, uh, especially with uh, the impact the Arab Spring had, I think, on Palestinians 
uh, and also Wall Street before the Wall Occupy Wall Street movements like that had on the Palestinian youth and their ability to articulate clearly an end game, a vision, a way forward uh, that is beginning to redefine what liberation of Palestine means in the 21st uh, uh, century. And I think because of that, it was possible to create this incredible solidarity between uh, uh, different groups of Palestinians, despite the, the colonialist policy of divide and rule that has been going on for so many years since the creation of the State of Israel, if not even uh, before that. So so I think, I think, yes, this is a different kind of solidarity. This is a different kind of, of unity. And uh, I think it will continue even if the, the, the active part of it right now uh, would kind of peter out because uh, the violence uh, would subside for some reason. Uh, but it's, this is an impulse that cannot be stopped. And, and, and I think that the great solidarity of so many young people uh, around the world will only enhance it and make it a powerful transformative force on the ground. Thank you for that, Ilan. Um, I'd like to stay with you. And I think, you know, that question about the generational aspect is really interesting. It's something that we saw both with the first and, and the second intifada of young generations rising up. I know that you recently wrote an article for the International Socialism Journal about the youth in Gaza and their new perspectives of liberation in Palestine. So I'd like to ask you really, how big is this revolt generally. I mean, we've seen the footage online, but there's two million people in Gaza. We know actually the average age of that population is under the age of 24, I believe, many children and so on. So, you know, how what is their role? How big is it really in the streets? How many are out there? And I think it also links into a question that we've got from Rebecca Parler in the comments who says, what will it take to turn Palestinian resistance into that revolution? I mean, I'm sure hopefully it will be led by the young, but we need that unity amongst everyone. So yeah, I'd like to ask you that question. If that's okay, yeah, yeah, yeah it, definitely. I think it's, it's uh, first of all, it's important to, to, to tell our viewers that the Palestinian society is one of the youngest uh, societies in the world. And I'm talking about both the Palestinian uh, uh, in general and each in, uh, one of the different Palestinian societies in particular, uh, uh, the 50% are, are under 22, 23 years old. This is a, you, a very young uh, uh, society. And they are there in uh, great numbers. Uh, uh, and they are, it's not just the numbers. I, I mean, in the West Bank, we've ne we haven't seen for years now numbers of protesters coming to the uh, checkpoints. Uh, remember, they are not just uh, barred by the Israeli uh, army. They, they also are they have to deal with, with the PA uh, police when, when they go and demonstrate. Uh, areas where we thought that only the brave few would, would come and demonstrate are now filled with hundreds and thousands uh, of people. So there's a massive presence on the ground. There's a massive support uh, 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 behind, behind it. And this brings me to, to the question that um, uh, was it uh, Rebecca? Rebecca was asking. Uh, I don't think we're yet, we, we also have to, to, to be realistic and, and, and say this is not the revolution we are looking for to really transform uh, Palestine as a whole and the Palestinians as a whole into a free nation uh, in the free uh, uh, homeland. Uh, we, we're not there yet. We're definitely not there yet. But uh, I think that after 50 years where we were mesmerized by the discourse of the two-state solution, by the supposedly existence of two peace camps on both sides, by the liberal uh, and capitalist discourse uh, that the peace is around the corner, you just need to find some Palestinian you can talk to and, and everything will be fine. I think all these fabrication, all these charades uh, have been removed forcefully. And it's much easier now to put forward a different uh, uh, initiative, a different uh, vision uh, for the future led by these young people if they would be able to organize not just for the sake of demonstration, not just for the sake of strikes, but also for the sake of building a popular movement from below that would lead all of us uh, uh, forward. They have the potential to do it. There is an historical moment that calls for it. 
uh, there is an international community that supports it, uh, and hopefully this could be materialize sooner rather than, the, than later. Great, thank you so much for that. Like I said, I'd like to encourage people to continue to put in questions if they've got anyone specifically for our speakers. I think it's really important now that we turn to the question of the Netanyahu regime, the Israeli state, and their response. We've all seen the videos and the horrific Israeli terror and their actions, but I think it would be really important and interesting to delve into the question about how much this follows the pattern of Israeli actions from previous attacks, or are we seeing a progression of Netanyahu moving to the right? Is he heading to an all-out war and so on? So I'd like to come to Hossam first um, on this issue. Hossam, what do you think is Israel's game plan here? Do you think it goes beyond their strategy of simply, well, not simply, horrifically bombing Gaza every five or six years to keep the resistance at bay? Or is this a new sort of attack? Is this something part of something much larger? No, it's a new sort of attack because uh, you have to look at the timing. I mean, this is happening after uh, a series uh, of agreements that the Trump administration uh, kind of like uh, brokered slash pressured uh, some of the Arab rulers into it. And I don't like to use pressure that much because actually the Arab rulers, they are all in the same bed, uh, but they were never that explicit uh, uh, as they are, you know, I mean, today. Um, so in the beginning, I think the Israelis, uh, or not that I think, I mean, these are all like uh, uh, have been now leaked and published even in the Israeli press. The Israelis thought that they could teach the Palestinians a lesson, that they could crush completely the resistance uh, uh, and that they have the political capital, not just the military might, the political capital to do so empowered by their uh, uh, newly established uh, or newly publicized and newly deepened alliances uh, with the Arab regimes. Uh, to the extent that the uh, when the Egyptian intelligence services, who usually, you know, I mean, they play the role of mediation between the Palestinian uh, uh, resistance and uh, the occupation for their own opportunistic, of course, political goals, uh, the Israelis kind of like refused all of their offers and refused to listen to them and told them that we don't need your mediation. That's like in the beginning, because they thought that they could teach the Palestinians a lesson. And the sheer brutality that Refat even mentioned in the beginning of the event, uh, uh, this is even way, way more hor horrible than the previous uh, uh, wars. But the Palestinians are also putting up a bigger and stronger fight than the previous wars the performance of the Palestinian resistance is only getting stronger. Thank you for that, Hossam. I think that's actually a really good opportunity for us to come back to Refat um, around about this. I think without being too blunt, I'd like to ask Refat how much the Israeli attacks have dampened um, the Palestinian spirit. As Hossam just said, it's clear the Israelis want to teach the Palestinians a lesson, and yet the Palestinians will not back down, something which we've seen throughout history of resistance. Um, this is this is 73 years now of ethnic cleansing and domination. Um, and I'd like to ask you a bit about the Palestinian political forces from the Palestinian Authority to Hamas. Who's been leading the resistance and what's their relationship to the state and this uh, resistance we've seen? A big question for you there, I know. But... Since, uh, since this uh, Israeli wave of aggression started, I've been humming a famous uh, Irish uh, song, uh, uh, we have fought you for 800 years and we can fight you 800 more. And I think that we fought the Zionist movement for 100 years and we are willing to fight 100 years more, not that this uh, racist uh, uh, settler colonial regime is going to last that, uh, uh, that, that much. Uh, uh, this The question is two parts. Number one, the, the real resistance uh, is the the people, uh, the firefighters, the nurses, the mothers at home, the people on social media. There is a huge army of unprecedented uh, uh, number of people on social media uh, exposing Israeli uh, crime, showing the world Israel for what it is as, as racist uh, uh, apartheid. Uh, uh, those people, uh, uh, in, in a way, hold the, the resistance and carry the resistance. Many of those people are critical of what Hamas is doing as a government or 
some other uh, political factions. But when it comes to the resistance, when the resistance shows that they have really, really been working really hard in order to defend them, to defend us, there is always respect. There's always this support, unprecedented support. And Israel understands this, understands that the, the let's not forget uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the Islamic Jihad also is, is, is playing part of, part of this, the popular front for the liberation of Palestine and other small factions. They're all doing an amazing, an amazing job. And Israel understands this. And that's why it started this wave of mass destruction because they want to crush us. They want, uh, I remember in 2009, an Israeli officer said, when Palestinians go out, they're not going to recognize Gaza. And I think this is happening now more than ever uh, uh, before. People who venture out for a moment see the unprecedented uh, uh, damage. Uh, it, we are hurt. We are pushed to despair. We are human beings after all. Momentarily, we feel weak especially at night when Israel opens the gates of hell, uh, opens a tenth circle of, of hell that Dante didn't speak about even. Uh, 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 but at the end of the day, there is a greater goal. We stand for a, a Palestinian cause. And like I, I suggested, more and more people start now, especially again, thanks to social media, an engagement with, with people outside Palestine in America, Black Lives Matter. I mentioned many of those. Uh, people. And that's why, to digress, I, I'm inviting you to try to hold sessions with some of those Palestinians from Gaza. This communication, this interaction uh, uh, puts Palestine on the, the global map of how it fits, how it's part of this, how it doesn't contradict. There was this uh, 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 horrible meme at the beginning of, of the aggression, people saying, ah, there was uh, a lot of uh, media attention for George uh, Floyd and Black Lives Matter. Uh, matter, but nobody cares about Palestine. I said, sorry, shut up. We don't contradict. We build on this. We stand with the, the struggle of our uh, brothers and sisters, uh, uh, black brothers and sisters around the world in America facing police brutality and systematic uh, racism. We are part of this. We learn from you. We, we, we complement your struggle. And that's why, in, if you remember Ferguson uh, uh, under Obama, there was a huge uprising. And the Palestinians on social media were giving advice to black activists, uh, protesters, how to deal with uh, tear gas and how to, you know, uh, uh, do it. So, yes, there is out of popular support. And the more ag ag aggressive Israel grows, the more Palestinians believe that this is the right way. Because if Israel hates something, then we are on the right side of history. Yes, certainly. Thank you for that reflect. And I think, you know, a little bit later, I'd like to return to some questions about how, you know, Israel fits into the border struggle. And like you said, you're absolutely right about the border struggles and the fights against structural racism and imperialism across the world. We'll definitely return to some of those questions. And um, for now, I'd like to stick with the question of Israel, and I'm going to come to Elan. Um, both Rafat and, and Hossam actually have already mentioned, I think Rafat in his in first contribution mentioned the pogroms um, and the disgusting lynchings that we've seen in um, Israeli cities such as Lint. And I'd like to ask you what you think the significance of these right-wing nationalist mobs has. Um, does this mean that the Netanyahu regime has let, has let its right-wing elements out of control? Of course, there's now Kahanist MKs as part of the government and so on. And I'd like to understand and explore a little bit the role that these nationalist mobs have and their relation to the Netanyahu regime. And uh, Netanyahu is playing a very cynical role when it comes to these... Uh, uh, terrorists. These are really terrorist organizations. Um, what he does, uh, he knows that when they are uh, in the street, uh, he could get the kind of instability, uh, rioting, uh, violence that he wants in order to, to claim, first of all, that there is no place to replace him. We should never forget that. I mean, that's at the very heart of this particular a series of provocation uh, is is the criminal a criminal prime minister who doesn't want to go to court and probably doesn't want to go to, to jail and believes that uh, uh, such a igniting such a, a violence 
uh, would ensure that he can remain in, in power. So, so I think that that's that's and, and these gangs um, create the kind of of what he would like to to see as, as rights. Secondly, uh, he uses and always used very freely a racist uh, a discourse and, and language about the Palestinians in Israel. The, these young uh, Jews are the product uh, of his uh, his kind of education and his kind of indoctrination. And, uh, uh, and once it was sort of hidden and Israelis were trying to, to show the liberal Zionist uh, face of it, this is gone. This is now uh, a clear uh, apartheid state with a clear uh, public opinion that can only be uh, described as a racist uh, one. So I think that they play an important role in exposing what happens when a settler colonial ethnic state is allowed to uh, continue ethnic cleansing, dispossession, and at the same time is hailed around the Western world as the only democracy uh, in the Middle East. That is what you get in the end of the day. If you don't uh, dare uh, as a Western uh, uh, block or a Western uh, community of states, if the, you don't dare to, to call the reality of what it is, uh, it will hit you back uh, in the face. And um, I can also imagine, you know, you and I are, are Jews, and, and uh, I, I just wonder how our liberal friends, liberal Zionist friends, who always tell us, you know, there are certain red lines that if they are being crossed, we will not support uh, Israel a anymore. And the, we know that these red lines are very elastic. That they keep uh, expanding and expanding. Uh, but they, they might, they must feel something, uh, as, especially European Jews. Uh, uh, I, I don't believe that, that they, deep down they don't understand, begin to understand what the Zionist project is leading to and why there needs to be a totally different project of humanity on the ground uh, in Palestine. Thank you for that, Elan. Um, I'd just like to ask you, uh, I guess, a follow-up question on that. You mentioned, of course, we're both Jews and a lot of these have, a lot of these things have, people have said that it links to Netanyahu and his right-wing politics. Of course, when I asked Hossam, is this a new kind of scale of, of revolt and action? It certainly was. And there are some liberal Zionists who call for a return to a different regime and blame all of this sort of chaos and violence simply on Netanyahu and the right. And I wonder what you think um, liberal Zionism has to say and actually are the attacks and the violence we see simply the logical conclusion of what it is to have a Zionist regime um, in, in, in the region and whether or not you think we can come back from that? Oh, no, no, definitely. I mean, uh, Israel is a settler colonial state created by a settler colonial movement. And settler colonialism is a structure, it's not an event. Uh, and what the uh, supposedly left wing of the Zionist movement did in 1948 uh, is still the biggest crime ever created or perpetrated by Zionists against the Palestinians. So liberal Zionists uh, uh, were as destructive and as ruthless and as inhuman towards the Palestinian as the right wing is, is today. Now, I don't believe in someone that can be an enlightened uh, occupier or a liberal, liberal colonizer uh, or a reformed ethnic cleansing. I, I think uh, th these are oxymorons. These are kind of uh, adjectives that cannot be attached to these kinds of behavior. So in many ways, the, the, uh, the impulse of the Zionist movement that was later institutionalized and uh, incorporated into the state of Israel, the impulse uh, was a typical impulse of settler colonial movement uh, to uh, get rid and remove the indigenous native people of the land into which the movement arrived as, as a group of settlers. Uh, this impulse has not changed. What changed were the means. Uh, the, the big difference was be, between liberal Zionism and the present uh, variety of Zionism that we have. Uh, the difference was that they believe that you should try and hide some of the things that you're doing, that you should try to commodify it as, as something else. That they believe they could shield uh, uh, what they were doing with with liberal uh, language uh, and democratic language and so on. 
uh, in many ways, I can understand the, the Jewish electorate in Israel. I mean, they'd rather have a, a real right-wing option than one that tries uh, to hide its, its, its real essence. So I think this was a natural shift that began already in 2000 from politics of deception, of trying to square the circle, talking about being both ethnic racist on the one hand and democratic and liberal on the other, uh, this has been totally, uh, dis this has totally disappeared. And now you have in the front of the eyes of the world, the, re the reality as it had been anyway for the last 70 years. And the big question is, of course, what do people with modicum of decency do when they cannot anymore claim that they don't know or that they can't see clearly what goes on? Thank you for that, Ilan. Um, I'd like to ask, a final question to Hossam on, on this issue before we move on. Um, Hossam, of course, what we've spoken about here, a lot of people think that these recent attacks are because Netanyahu's right wing. I think we're all in agreement. He is a right winger. Um, but even the more liberal um, Israeli leaders, like Elan has just said, have used brutal force in Palestine ever since 1948. Um, a lot of the recent tension um, to, in this most recent uprising started with the eviction of families in Sheikh Jarrah. And I wanted to ask you why that neighborhood has become so symbolic. What, what does it say about um, Israeli apartheid and ethnic cleansing? And also a sort of broader question we've both seen and agreed that Israel is a settler colonial state. What do the most recent episodes say about the nature of having a settler colonial state? And what can we learn from that? Um, I, I don't want to put uh, so much emphasis on Sheikh uh, Jarrah uh, uh, on itself because as the Palestinian protesters uh, in the streets uh, now are, are are like saying and carrying banners is that uh, all of the Israeli cities were Sheikh Jarrah uh, at some point um, but you had some form of uh, settler colonialism that's substitutionist they go there they 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 cleanse the land of uh uh, of the native population, and then they establish and erect uh, their own colonies. Um, so at the end of the day, it's not just about, um, I mean, a specific uh, neighborhood. Um, the, the level of consciousness of the Palestinians is way, way far ahead of us uh, now. And they are talking about uh, all of Palestine, uh, not just uh, Sheikh Jarrah. But I, I really found what Elan uh, was saying to be extremely inspiring and very correct. And I'm really happy that this is, you know, I mean, coming at the end of the day from someone who has seen this uh, settler colonial society and lived uh, uh, in it and, and have seen it from the inside. At the end of the day, I mean, our, our fight is not just with the right wing uh, Zionist establishment or just the far right. Zionist establishment, our fight is with the occupation. And the occupation and the Zionist movement definitely has factions. I mean, it has left and right, but at the end of the day, they are both united by the vision and by the direct material, material interests of maintaining apartheid and maintaining uh, Jewish supremacy uh, uh, in Palestine. Hence, uh, finding allies uh, among sections of that settler society is very, very difficult. We can find only elements or exceptions, people, you know, persons like Elan or, or others, but we're talking here like in an individual uh, uh, kind of sense, but not as a political uh, uh, movement uh, that is part of the Zionist establishment. Great, thank you for that, Hossam. And I think actually it's important now as well to touch on the international response and the other forces at play. Um, Israel isn't able to do this on its own um, and we understand that there are lots of other political forces um, at play here. So, Refat, I'd also like to ask you, come back to you and ask you a question. Of course, here in Britain and around the world, we've seen huge protests in support of Palestine. Over 100,000 here marched in London over the weekend. But despite this, our political leaders um, here in the UK and across in the US failed to stand in solidarity with Palestine. So, Refat, what role have international powers played in legitimizing what Israel is doing? 
I don't know if so. Rafat is, is still there if he hasn't been brought on on the screen. Uh, he is. It, everything, like Ilan just said, uh, Israel is a colonial uh, settler entity created by imperialism. But also, Israel came uh, to reality as some kind of, you know, the wages of uh, European anti-Semitism and racism. And they also, like, they wanted to fix anti-Semitism and racism, but they created more uh, racism and uh, oppression and discrimination. Uh, 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 Netanyahu, uh, I think Netanyahu is uh, in his, you know, he's, he's, a, he's a maniac in so many ways. He's a racist, he's a, uh, an extremist, race, uh, extremely racist. Uh, uh, he begit in, in so many ways, I can't describe how horrible he is. Uh, he can start wars and he can kill people and he can massacre them. He doesn't want the Europeans or the Americans to tell him what to do or not to do. But I think. At least Biden has the, the, the ability, America has the ability to tell him, uh, tone it down, don't do this. Why are you bombing media towers? But nothing. There's a green light, and that's why there's uh, Palestinian blood on the hands of uh, uh, Biden, who was supposed to be the lesser of the two, the, two, the two devils. And in my opinion, I think, and by the way, almost everybody I know in Palestine, in Gaza, cheered uh, for Biden because we we saw how horrible, how insanely horrible uh, uh, Trump was. And then uh, Biden, who in, in, I don't want to use words, I don't want to be accused of ageism, but this man, he, he's, he's a, a very old, dumb person with dementia. Sorry to say this, uh, uh, but, uh, and I think he wants to make a point to tell the people that I am powerful. And at the same time, he wants the, the, the Israeli lobby to to stand by him. The same thing applies to Germany, applies to, uh, to, to Britain and, and to France. France, um, again, I'm sorry to say this, I'm not, I, I, don't, I don't want to say it, I don't want to seem racist, but France brutalized the people in the streets just for uh, going out for, for, for Palestine. But on the official, on the official level, it's horrible. Germany is paying for the, the, uh, the weapons, is on Israel. The UK is arming Israel and giving uh, them the green light. America is doing the worst possible thing. And even thoughtlessly, two days ago, there was a report, I think it was yesterday, that America is paying almost a billion dollars more in, in, in aid to, to Israel. Where does this go? It kills Palestinians. There were reports all over the internet that most of Holocaust survivors live in abject poverty, whether in Israel or in and so clearly they don't get the money they, they deserve. And this is again very unlike the popular support and hopefully this popular support grows uh, in, in width and breadth and in every uh, sense in order to create, so those people in the street can become the politicians, the leaders of tomorrow, five years or 10 years. Thank you for that, Rifat. And I think, you know, you're right to draw the links between racism all across the world, the Islamophobia that's right at the very heart of the French state, um, the racism at the heart of the American state. Um, and of course, you know, the UK and international sales of arms to Israel, it was inspiring to see Italian dock workers refusing um, shipments there. And I, you know, encourage and hope other workers across Europe and the world continue in that fight. Um, Elan, I'd like to come back to you. Rafat mentioned Joe Biden, um, and despite being a so-called progressive, and despite Netanyahu, as you said, being a racist, an imperialist, and a war criminal, Joe Biden has still come to the swift defense of Israel um, and Netanyahu. And I'd like to ask you two questions, actually, um, one for myself and one for Rosemary Yates in the chat. But firstly, what does the latest uprising and assault mean for Netanyahu's plan and imperialism within the region? And also, I think, in terms of international response, Rosemary Yates has asked on Facebook, what is the importance of BDS in that struggle and its ability to try and affect and rock the Israeli regime? So two questions for you there, Ilan. Yeah, yeah. Well, uh, it's, I, I think Netanyahu, as I said, uh, is a, I think we thought to kind of describing quite well. It's a curious mixture of, of someone who's really has personal issues, uh, patholo pathological issues, 
uh, of staying in power, regardless, put aside for a moment the ideology and everything else, but one that thinks that um, aggressive, brutal policy towards the Palestinians and aggressive, dangerous policies in the region uh, serves his own, not just his own ideological uh, uh, viewpoint, but also his personal uh, obsession of uh, uh, retaining power uh, as, as prime minister. And, and because of that, he already, before the, the, the present provocation, he was trying, and I'm sure he will continue, and try and provoke Iran by all kinds of uh, actions that we have seen, attacking Iranian oil tankers, uh, I I Iranian installations, and so on, trying to undermine uh, uh, the, our uh, the world's ability to to reach an understanding with Iran on nuclear uh, issues. I think we should expect more of this and and far more aggressive uh, action uh, on this. I mean, the man uh, will ignite uh, the whole area if he could uh, either f for this fusion of his personal ambition on the one hand and the ideological. Uh, context in which he was uh, was born. That's uh, as we know from other cases in history. Uh, this is a, a, a lethal uh, a combination. As for the second question, I think that the BDS has an important role uh, to play. Um, uh, I think you, we we need all the time to recruit more people that would believe that this is a legitimate line of action. That this is an effective line of action. That this is a moral uh, line of action. And unfortunately, it is in moments like this that maybe people who are not that aware of what goes on or don't have the patience to follow the more smaller or the, uh, to follow the smaller violations of human rights and civil rights that you only understand them when they accumulate. In, 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 in events like this, in moments like this, they are exposed to many things that we uh, be, uh, claim de deserve the, or uh, justify the BDS uh, movement. Uh, and uh, I, I think that uh, a large, uh, effective uh, and, and powerful BDS movement uh, plays a, will play a very important role in our attempt to translate what is already going on, which is a dramatic fundamentalist shift in uh, public opinion in favor of Palestinian, I think the BDS would be the tool that would help us to translate this public support into a big influence on politics from above, on mainstream politics, on mainstream media, mainstream academia. It plays a very important, uh, not just in galvanizing civil society, but making the civil society a powerful, a tool that can affect eventually also uh, the reality on the ground. Great, thank you for that, as clear as always. Um, we're at eight o'clock, we're gonna aim to finish by quarter past eight, but I'm sure everyone in our audience is enjoying and finding this conversation as interesting as, as I am. I'm certainly learning a lot. So I'd like to com come to Hossam um, on this question about the international response and other forces at play before I come back to each of our final our speakers for a final word. Two questions as well for you, Hossam. Of course, you played a role in the Egyptian revolution, which had Palestine at its heart. Um, what role do other countries in the region, both their leaders and the masses on the ground have to play in the road for Palestinian liberation. Um, and also we've had a question in the comments from Kalsoum Salim linking with Egypt saying, why won't Egypt open the border with Gaza to allow medical aid and food supplies to get in? So I think it'd be quite interesting if you could briefly explore the role of other countries in the region and how we can build that sort of international solidarity with Palestine. Uh, I think uh, uh, Kalsoum's question uh, is actually um, kind of like sums up uh, the role that the Arab regimes are doing vis-a-vis uh, -vis the Palestinians. Uh, the right wing and the Israeli propaganda in general, I mean, depicts Israel as being surrounded by a sea of, of Arab regimes that just wants to throw it in the sea. But in, in reality, while the vast majority of the Arab population uh, look um, 
and dream of the liberation of Palestine and they extend their solidarity to their brothers and sisters in Palestine. But our Arab regimes are complicit. Uh, they are all um, uh, in bed uh, with US imperialism and with Zionism. Uh, they more or less, most of them are either like clients for the US or clients for other international powers. But the common denominator between all of them is that they regard Palestine as a factor for instability, a factor that threatens them, a factor that provides inspiration for their people to rebel and to follow suit. So the Arab regimes are not just spectators, they are direct participants in the wars, and usually they are on the side of Israel, even if they didn't uh, uh, publicize it. And Usually their condemnations, you know, I mean, publicly is only limited to the diplomatic uh, milieu, but like on the ground, they are strangling the Palestinians. They are conspiring against the Palestinian resistance. They all have uh, their relations with the Israeli state in one form uh, or the other. They share intelligence. In the case of the 2014 war, for example, uh, CC and the UAE, uh, which kind of like spearheading the Arab counter-revolution, uh, were conspiring daily uh, and were coordinating the war daily uh, with the Israelis. Now, there are conflicting reports whether the Rafah crossing has been opened today uh, uh, or not, uh, but the Rafah crossing is being used by the Egyptian regime in order to pressure the Palestinians into submission or to uh, pressure uh, the Palestinian uh, uh, resistance into giving concessions to the Israelis. Uh, following the coup in 2013, I think initially Sisi thought that he could strangle Hamas and choke it out uh, and eradicate it uh, from Gaza, but Hamas proved resilient and, and it continued. And it wouldn't have continued without the support of the Palestinian people who still regard Hamas, even with all the disagreements and with all the criticism, as a legitimate uh, uh, resistance force. Great, thank you for that, Hossam. I'm now going to come to the final question for each of our speakers, which is, of course, going to focus on how can Palestine be free? I'm sure an answer that all of us want to get to and see. So, Refat, I'd like to come to you first. Um, we've mentioned that you're on the ground in Gaza. I'd like to ask what you think the recent episode shows us about Palestinian resistance. Also, Hossam was just speaking about Hamas there. Ian in the chat has asked, do you think Hamas and Fatah need to put aside their differences and in the future remain a united front for this success? I think we've seen, despite the efforts of uh, political forces, it's actually always been ordinary Palestinians who have resisted on the grounds. There's that real tradition within Palestine. So what are the prospects of liberation? The thing is that uh, Fatah and Hamas has uh, the uh, two biggest uh, uh, political parties in, in, in occupied Palestine. You can't, uh, uh, Hamas can't function without Fatah, and Fatah can't function without Hamas. And this is a sad reality. Uh, and sadly, uh, Fatah does not own its uh, its destiny or decision. It can't uh, choose to reconcile, even when the, uh, there is close reconciliation talks, etc. Uh, there will always be pushed back not to do this, not to uh, form any government. And this is world pressure, America, Europe. If you uh, reconcile with Hamas, they are terrorists. We're not going to give you money anymore, we're not going to deal with you. Yes, there must be uh, some sort of reconciliation, at least where we unite, uh, 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 at least in, in, in cases, on occasions like uh, like what we are seeing here in, uh, in Gaza today. But if I want to be radical, uh, we need to talk about the Palestinian Authority, because this is, again, Israel ruling by proxy. Israel giving a few Palestinians Hussein means something very crucial about how the Palestinian resistance is escalating day by day. And while the the, the uh, sorry the first Intifada started by stones and you know Molotovs etc., the last couple of years Palestinian freedom fighters managed to cap uh, to to uh, to to uh, carry out heroic valiant uh, uh, military occupations against soldiers 
and take their weapons. And then uh, every couple of months, we will have a, a heroic attack like this, and the Palestinians taking the weapons. So with this craziness in, in Israel thinking, they said, okay, let's bring some of those Palestinians, and then they can rule each other, and then they can kill each other. Uh, America, is uh, the national community gave the Palestinian Authority privileges, VIPs, jobs, millions of dollars, and those people cannot simply let go of this. They can't simply let go of this. So there is a lot for them to lose. So, and that's why the, the, the Oslo and again, the, uh, 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 the, you know, uh, the Palestinian Authority, they are the main obstacle if there is I, I was uh, talking to, to a friend of mine about the, 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 the wonderful change in America. And he, he, he laughed and said, because there is no uh, Palestinian authority there in, in America. Now, they don't, you know, Trump shut down their offices and everything. And we don't have that much of uh, solidarity or movement uh, uh, or mass protests in the West Bank, basically because of the Palestinian authority. I'm sorry to say this, but it's the reality. There has to be unity. And there can never be unity as long as one uh, 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 part, one half of the you know society or forty percent of the society is sub sub uh, what's the word uh, is you know ruling us on behalf of Israel, ruling us by proxy. Thank you for that. I think it's a really important thing to draw out. And once again, thank you so much, Rafat, for joining us. Solidarity to you in Gaza. Um, and so we send our solidarity and support to you. Elan, again, final words and a similar question. We know that this is the latest in 73 years of occupation and oppression. What lesson have we learned from the last few weeks in terms of fighting against Israeli apartheid? And I'd like to think about an international response from you. Of course, we've spoken about BDS, but it's been clear from previous resistance and intifadas that there's always been that resistance on the ground in Gaza. And what we've said now, which has been unique, is we've seen it extend to historic Palestine, seen a level of national unity between Palestinians, those of Israeli citizenship and the diaspora, despite the political vacuum and political disunity that um, Refat just mentioned and spoke about. So my final question to you is what significance does this have when it comes to international solidarity and, su and support for Palestine here in the UK and across the world? Yes, I, I think that uh, what we have seen is um, uh, the, the kind of uh, two major uh, processes that have to, to work in tandem uh, uh, are now beginning to be synchronized. Uh, one, one process that was going very fast and very well was international solidarity. And as you mentioned, it was not just the BDS, it is the fact that in the last 10 years, uh, the, the uh, solidarity networks has really grown and now it includes uh, minorities uh, in, in Britain, uh, uh, in the United States, in Brazil. It includes uh, uh, Muslim communities in Southeast Asia, uh, indigenous people all over the world, workers uh, uh, who are uh, victims of uh, neo-liberalism uh, uh, and neo-capitalism that acts like settler colonialism against the workers. So we have uh, uh, seen a, 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 an amazing expansion of international solidarity, but we were always worried that on the ground the Palestinian National Movement was uh, uh, kind of stopped and, and had hindered, was hindered by internal factionalism, uh, uh, disunity and inability uh, uh, to form a clear a vision instead of uh, the two-state solution which the PA uh, uh, and even the leadership of the uh, Arabs, uh, the 48 Arabs are still propagating. So I think that now that we, we can see that this other process on the ground has been accelerated and intensified, I mean, it would be great if it would also mature into a clear vision about the future. What is the end game? And we will all uh, go behind it. Those of, uh, who show solidarity from within and those who show solidarity from without. Uh, and I think this this could really lead us all to, to uh, a very different kind of reality uh, in historical Palestine. And of course, never, never to forget that this all will not be complete if the refugees who were expelled in 1948 and ever after would not be allowed to uh, to return. We need 
to uphold the right of return of these refugees as part of the vision of the future, together, to my mind, with a democratic state from the river to the Mediterranean, dismantling the colonialist structure, the colonialist institution, and, and allowing the indigenous native people of Palestine to have normal life, something that was denied of them in the last 100 years and so. Certainly. Thank you so much again, Elan, for joining us. It's always Thank a pleasure. You. And I couldn't agree more from the river to the sea, a one secular democratic state in Palestine and the right to return for all refugees and diaspora. Hossam, I'd like to come to you again now for a final word. The Palestinians, as we've seen and discussed today, bravely keep fighting in the hardest of circumstances and they're an inspiration to us all. What does the recent episode tell us about how we can fight for Palestine to be free? We've seen that peace deals and political forces have got us nowhere. It has been ordinary people rising up that has shook the Israeli state the most. And just like Elam mentioned, this is not disconnected from imperialism, neoliberalism and capitalism and how it operates. So I'd like to ask you, what would a revolutionary strategy for Palestinian liberation look like? Um, uh, each time uh, the whole world thinks that uh, the Palestinian cause is dead, the Palestinians always surprise us uh, uh, by showing resilience and by going on uh, a new uprising. Um, while Palestinians are showing us the way forward, and I definitely are uh, not in a position to tell them what to do and what not to do on the ground, but at the same time, what Refat has just said, I mean, sums it up. I mean, the, the Palestinian Authority is the product uh, of the Oslo uh, Accords, is the product uh, of colonialism and apartheid. It's uh, pacifying the Palestinians on behalf of uh, the Israelis and, uh, and US imperialism. And step one towards any radical uh, uh, solution in order to liberate Palestine will have to start by dissolving this PA. It cannot be reformed. But this is for the Palestinians definitely to, to decide. But for us outside Palestine, I mean, as Arabs in, in, in the region, um, all throughout my life, in all the protests that I've attended or organized in, in Egypt, the protesters were always chanting or were raising the slogans of the road to Jerusalem passes through Cairo or the road to Jerusalem passes through the Arab capitals. The real support that we as Arabs can give to the Palestinians is to overthrow our own regimes that are clientelistic uh, to both Zionism and US imperialism. Imagine if this current uprising that's happening today in Palestine was taking place while there were revolutionary regimes in Egypt, Jordan, Syria, and in, in the rest of the region that's not strangling the Palestinians, that's not choking Gaza off, that's not trying to starve them into submission, but actually a revolutionary regime that has a stated goal publicly of supporting the Palestinian resistance and the creation of one secular democratic state under the name of Palestine for all of its inhabitants without any discrimination or supremacy or apartheid. So the way forward for us as Arabs is, if you want to help the Palestinians, get rid of your own uh, uh, ruler. Now, this is definitely not easy uh, uh, to be done as said, uh, but the 2011 uh, revolts, as well as the 2019 revolts, they show us glimpses of what liberation uh, could, could look like. When the Egyptian revolution took place, Tahrir hosted millions and millions of protesters who were waving the Palestinian flags, who wanted to march on uh, Palestine, who were calling on the Egyptian military to uh, uh, dissolve all relations with the Israeli state, who actually stormed the Israeli embassy twice uh, uh, in order to actually more or less like enforce BDS uh, uh, by our own hands, by direct action. Uh, so that's our way forward. And if we cannot get rid of our own regimes now, at least we should do our best to support BDS and to stop the normalization campaigns that the Arab regimes are doing with the Israelis. Perfect. Thank you so much, Hassam, and to all of our speakers. 
I think it's important that we have to keep speaking out in support of Palestine. We have to say that this is not a conflict. This is not civil unrest. This is apartheid. It's racism. It's a settler colonial regime. Once and again, the Palestinians have shown that against all odds, they are fighting back and protesting, going on strike and resisting Israeli terror. And it is our duty here to stand with them and to say victory to the resistance. So with that, I'd like to finish with a couple of announcements before we say goodbye to you at home and our speakers. Firstly, anyone who is watching from London, there is a national demonstration this Saturday, which has been called by the Palestine Solidarity Campaign. The details of the demonstration will be put in the chat, but you can find it on our Facebook page, on our Instagram page, and so on, Socialist Workers' Party. If you're not already following us, please do give us a follow and share this event. Secondly, I think we have to arm ourselves with the arguments and the theory that we've gone through today. Um, Bookmarks Bookshop, the link is down below on your screen, is an amazing socialist and independent bookshop. You can get copies of Elan's book, but read around much wider around the basis of Zionism, the resistance in Palestine and voices from the West Bank and so on. So please do get your books from there, not from Amazon. We say it every time. We don't need to say how bad Amazon are now at the moment. And lastly, I'd like to say and encourage anybody who's enjoyed this conversation, felt like they learned something, have agreed with what we've said, I'd urge you to join the Socialist Workers' Party. The link is also now on the bottom of your screens. We've seen that we have to support the resistance, but we cannot do it as individual activists. Just as Hossam said, we need to uproot imperialism and oppressive regimes, not just in Israel, but all across the world. And the only way we can do that is with a united, mass, internationalist and revolutionary party that works against capitalism, oppression and imperialism and fights for the liberation of people all across the world and for a better one in socialism. So just now I'd like to say thank you once again. Thank you to Rafat who came in from Gaza, to Hossam in Berlin and to Ilan in Haifa. Thank you once again to me from, uh, from London and we'll see you in the struggle. We'll see you on the demonstrations. And of course we have to sign off with stay safe, stay socialist and freedom for Palestine. So thank you everyone. Thank you very much. Bye. Thank you very much.